Uh, okay, hello, um, welcome to the class. Um, here is the plan for, uh, for this week. Um, so the first order of business is that um, homework three submission is this coming Thursday. Um, and the second order of business is that uh, thank you for filling in the, the midpoint uh, survey. Uh, the feedback was actually very useful and super helpful. So um, we are already acting on it and uh, we are preparing some new lectures that will be brand new. Um, and uh, thank you for that. So thank you everyone who sent us feedback how to improve the course. Uh, we are already acting on it. So now uh, what we talk about this week, this week we'll talk about uh, large scale machine learning. Um, and in particular, we'll, we'll touch on two classes of models. Today we will talk about something called large scale decision trees and how would you uh, build these types of models over petabytes of data. And then on Thursday we'll talk more about neural network models and how do you make those scale and so on. And kind of our goal here is not necessarily to cover everything that 229 covers, but focus more on the scalability and practical issues. So that's how we are uh, going to think about that. Uh, great, right? So where we are right now is we'll be talking about uh, uh, this, uh, this side of things. And this will be very interesting because last time I talked about graph embeddings and creating feature vectors out of nodes. So once you have those feature vectors, you would use one of the methods we'll talk today and then um, on Thursday um, uh, uh, to, to basically train the models and make predictions. What's the goal? At high level, the idea is that you want to learn a function that maps the input to the output. That's all what machine learning is about. So the idea is that we are given a set of training examples, right, some x comma y, and this y is a function of x. Um, and given this pairs x comma y, I would like to uh, learn or approximate the function f. That is, that's essentially what we try to do, right? So given the x, I want to predict y. Um, and this x can be a multidimensional vector of some features and y can be some output variable. And this is the most common form of learning and it's called supervised learning. The reason is because for every x we are given a super supervision, a supervised signal y. There are uh, other types of learning rather than supervised. So for example, clustering or singular value decomposition, you can think of it as a form of unsupervised learning where basically we are given some just x's, no y's, and our, our goal is to learn some function of those x's, like the clustering structure of those x's. Then on graphs, what many times happens is that you are in this what is called semi-supervised regime where you are given some labeled data and you are also given some unlabeled data and your goal is to estimate this function. The, the simplest way to do this is to ignore unlabeled data and just use the labeled pairs to learn the function. But you could use your unlabeled data x to help you figure out how this function should look like, right? So you can learn more. Then there are other examples, for example, active learning. The setting here is that whenever you make a prediction, only then you observe the value. So if you think, for example, in, in recommender systems, recommender systems play in this type of role when I make you a recommendation, right? I predict how much you will like the movie and then I see whether you liked it or not, right? So I make a prediction, make a decision, and then the system gives me feedback. And then I can learn something about what kind of movies you like. And the way you would do this in, let's say, the, when we talked about latent factor recommender systems is that you would make your predictions, get the outputs and then you would re-optimize the model, run a couple of iterations of stochastic gradient descent to update your f based on the feedback uh, you have re received. And then the last thing I will mention is this notion of transfer learning where I want to learn some f of x, but really I want to, it to learn in such a way that it works well on some new domain on some new data set z. Right? Maybe I, I have a data set of movie recommendations uh, and I want to be able this function to predict what music you will like, right? And that is called transfer because you transfer from one domain to another domain. But you see how all these different kinds at the end worry about finding this function uh, f that can make uh, um, certain kinds of predictions. So now the question is, um, how are we going to formalize this, right? We would like to do predictions, so it means we'd like to estimate this function f so that uh, y equals f of x, okay? And then you can say what can y be and y can be different things. If y is a real number, then we call this regression, right? Then we call this predicting the real number, we call it a regression. 
If we are predicting a categorical number, you know, like a color or, you know, big, small, medium or whatever, then I would call this classification. And then there are also prediction can be very complex. For example, um, uh, in, in recommender systems, you could imagine that what you are really predicting is not just how much you will like a certain item, but actually the ranking, the ordering of the items. Or in natural language processing, you could say, given a sentence, I want to predict the entire parse tree of that sentence, right? So here, the output object is not just a number or a, or a category, but it's really a complex objects. And, and things get very interesting when you go beyond uh, simple regression and classification, right? And another important point is data is labeled. So it means we have many pairs of x comma y, where x, you know, we can think it as a long vector of some kind of binary, categorical, real valued attributes or features. And then the y value, we'll call it a class or a real number. This is the output that goes together um, with, that, uh, with that x. What is our goal? Our goal is that given some what we will call labeled data x comma y, we want to build this function f so that it works well on some unseen data um, uh, x prime and makes good predictions uh, y prime, okay? So in some sense, uh, the, the interesting thing about machine learning, which is this kind of this goal that we'll never really be able to achieve, is that I'm given some data x and y, and I can build my function f using this. But what I will really care about is that when some unknown data, unseen data x, x prime comes, I'm predicting these labels well, right? So I always worry about how well will I be able to do on the stuff I haven't yet seen, right? It's on some future data. In some sense, I don't care how well can I predict the movies people liked tomorrow, uh, sorry, yesterday, but I really care how well will I be able to predict movies tomorrow. And maybe I'm making some assumption that, you know, the, the structure of the movie recommender yesterday will kind of generalize to tomorrow, right? So there is this, um, and the way we think of this is we think of the red part of the data as the training data, and the, um, the blue part of the data, we think of it as the, as the test data. But if you think about deploying your model in production, making recommendations in or predictions in real time, the point is that this, does, hasn't, this data hasn't even been generated, right? These users haven't even yet shown up to your, uh, uh, to your website. Or, you know, these uh, emails, if you are classifying them, haven't even been written yet, right? That's the idea. From training, I want to generalize to test, right? So this hope where we say that we want this f of x to also work on this unknown uh, labels uh, data x prime or y prime, this hope is called generalization, right? So in some sense, we don't care how well can we fit the red part. What we really care about is how well do we fit this blue part that we haven't yet seen, and we don't know how it is, right? And this formalizing this hope is called generalization. And if you don't generalize, then the notion is that you overfit. And overfit means that you, you build your function f that predicts the data y, the red data, really well, but is unable to predict the data you haven't yet seen. So it's unable to make prediction on, on uh, unseen data, so out of sample predictions, right? So we all, all we worry about is generalization out of sample, okay? So we want a model that generalizes well to this unseen data. That's and I spent a minute talking about this because this is very important, right? Is that in some sense, we wanna, we have training data, but we don't care about mastering the training data. We really care about mastering the data that hasn't yet even appeared to us, right? And this means we have to be very careful about how are we thinking about our models? How are they going to generalize? What is going to happen tomorrow given what we've seen today? And so on and so forth, right? And if you think about these types of things, Imagine, Im like, one thing that happens, for example, in data is that um, every day of the week, different type of people come to your, to your, to your application. So maybe you want to create a separate f of x that, that you only deploy on Saturdays and Sundays, because on those days, people that visit your application or your website are very different than, you know, the Mondays or, you know, the Tuesdays uh, people and so on. And so this means that you really need to think about how am I generalizing to, date, to, 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 to the future, and how does that future look like, right? So you may think about different days of the week and so on and so forth. Because the goal is not to memorize the training data well, the goal is to be able to predict to unseen data. 
So that's the, what I want you to take home. So now you can say, why do you care about the scale? You know, we care about fancy models. Um, it turns out, I'll give you two examples, one coming from Microsoft and one later coming from Google, where basically the, 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 the bottom line is, um, the title of this works is essentially unreasonable effectiveness of big data. So, and the, the point is, this is now, you know, from uh, 15 years ago from Microsoft, where they were doing large scale evaluations of machine learning based language translation. You are given a sentence and you want to translate it to, um, in one language and you want to translate it to another language. And what they did here is they said how much training data they have versus performance. And they tr tested four different approaches, some very simple, some very complex and very fancy. And essentially what, what, the, what the bottom line is that as you have more data, your things will work better and it doesn't really matter that much what particular fancy model you pick, right? So size of the training data set matters more than the, the, than the structure of the models itself. And as the data set size grew, the performance, the, difference, the performance difference between the models becomes much tinier, right? So again, the idea is when you have little data, you want to be very careful how you design your model so you can learn from little. When you have a lot, you just need, you just need a, a, a big model and, and the data will take care of it. So this is, uh, here is the, here's the paper, this is one, and here is now the, uh, the work from Google from two years ago titled Unreasonable, Unreasonable Effectiveness of Big Data, where what they did was they were trying out the latest deep learning based methods, and what they find is that here is the number of training examples of millions, here is the, the performance, and you see how performance keeps increasing as, as you have more data. Right, so if there is a reason for the current machine learning revolution is essentially, I would say there are two. One is that we have good systems and good hardware and the other one is that we have data, right? That we can now train big complex models um, on large scale data, like in vision if you think of it, self-driving and so on and so forth, right? So the point is that l large amounts of data and big models give you great results. But one without the other kind of won't, uh, won't work. And when I say large models, I mean models that are expressive, right? And deep learning models are kind of decadently expressive models, all right? So that's the, that's the case why this matters, right? And especially in industrial settings where you have a lot of data, fanciness doesn't matter. What matters is that you can effectively learn from big, big, big amounts of data and, and push up the performance of your model. All right, so that's the, that's the idea. So now what I want to talk to you about is kind of, an, uh, we'll talk about two types of models. Next week we'll, we'll talk about neural networks and how do you deal with that. And today we'll talk like an, about an old class of models called decision trees. But decision trees are kind of this workhorse that it's amazingly hard to beat whenever you have well-structured data with good features. Um, it's just kind of amazingly good you know, I think it's from 1980s, older than I am, but it's good stuff, okay? So decision trees. Um, here is how we think of this, right? So we are given, we'll be, we'll be given a, an attribute, and let's say that we want to predict the, uh, the value of uh, people's uh, lifespan by uh, means of some other um, attributes of that person, right? So you could imagine that every person, I want to predict their longevity, so I'll be given, every person will be represented by D numbers, I'll number uh, which are the D features, X1 to XD. Um, each feature will have some domain, uh, meaning like uh, features can be cate categorical, maybe it's the color of the eyes, okay, sorry, you cannot have, maybe hair, okay, you can have red hair and uh, blue hair, Oh, sorry, it doesn't work out either. Okay, maybe you were taking a picture with a red sweater or a blue sweater, okay? Um, then you have uh, numerical variables like uh, H and so on, right? And then you have the output variable that can be uh, categorical like classification or could be numerical like uh, regression. And then you are given data, Xi comma Yi, where xi is this d-dimensional vector and yi is the output variable. The task is given the input vector x, predict the output variable or label uh, y. Okay, so now what is a decision tree? Decision tree is this tree structured model 
Basically, it's a, it's a plan of a set that tells you which sequence of attributes to test to determine the output. So here is what I mean by this. It is simply a, a discrete type structure where the idea is that um, um, uh, this tree has, uh, at every node of the tree we have a condition that says what variable, what attribute to look at, at what value, and then if that condition is satisfied we go left, and if it's not satisfied we go right. Right, so this is a particular rule. It says at node C2 examine the second feature and see if the value of the second feature is V1 or V2, then go to the left, otherwise go to the right. Okay, and that's, that's called uh, a decision tree, right? So we have this notion that um, each node splits the data in two, di in two directions, right? Whether the condition at the node is uh, satisfied or not, the data gets split to the left and to the right. Okay, and then every leaf node makes a prediction, right? So for example, if I would take a data point, I would drop it at the node A, and then I would evaluate the condition, the first condition whether the first feature of that data point is less than V1, the answer is yes, then my prediction would be 42. And if the answer would be no, I would keep evaluating that data point and I would look at the second feature, see whether that feature is less than V2, if it is, I would go here and so on and so forth, okay? So this is a decision tree. So it's essentially this um, sequence of rules that tell me what variable do I have to examine and what's the threshold value, right? And today we will simplify this a bit and say, let's look at what are called binary splits, where I will say only yes and no, right? But you could have multi-way splits if you like, but we'll do just binary splits. We look at the categorical attributes and we will look at the regression, meaning we'll predict a real valued y, okay? So that's the simplification for today. So now, the, the, as I said, how do you make prediction? The way you make a prediction is that you simply kind of drop your data point x from the top and then you follow down the tree until you hit a leaf node. And in the leaf node, you get the, uh, that the leaf node tells you what the prediction is uh, for all the data, for all the data points that hit that node, okay? So I drop it down, I evaluate the condition, and the point goes until it hits a leaf node, and then I read out the prediction at the leaf node. So making predictions one that once the tree, once you have the tree, should be quite easy. Now um, the question, uh, the question will be, how do we build the tree? Given data, how do you build the tree? And one way you can think of um, of, um, of, the, of the data is the following. Imagine I have this type of data set in two dimensions. Then I can start building the tree at the top and whenever I have a condition, I'm in some sense slicing this space into two, right? So if I say, imagine this is, uh, this is um, x1 and this is x2. Uh, sorry, this is x1 and this is x2, right? So if I'm saying x1 less than v1, then I'm saying I have this green line something is above it, something is below it, right? So now everything that's above it, I could further, um, everything that's below it, sorry, I could further split, right? I could split here on attribute uh, x2 and value v2 and say, aha, uh -huh, are you less than this or more than that, right? And if I look at this, this is now perfectly um, uh, blue, so I could decide, oh, if you end up here, I will make a prediction, right? So we just described this area of the space, and if the data point comes here, then it will go left at the node A, it will go left at the node F, and we'll say you are blue, right? Now we need to look at this part, right? And you could say, okay, in this part, um, I will talk about that later, let me continue this part, right? So what do you do up here? What do you do up here? You could create another split uh, on uh, uh, variable x2 and value v3, and again, you would get like this uh, perfect type of thing, right? Everything to the left is blue and everything to the right is red. So you would create these two prediction nodes that says if the, if the value of x2 is less than v3, go left, otherwise go right, right? And now we need to decide what to do here. Do we want to make some prediction or do we continue splitting? And if I decide to continue splitting, I would maybe want to split on uh, variable x2 on value v4, right? And here is my condition. And then, you know, everything to the left um, is, uh, is uh, less than v4 and everything to the right is more than v4, 
right? And again, for this part, I could just decide to add a prediction out and predict a minus. And here, I probably need another split. So I would be splitting on, on value of x1, but this, uh, sorry, on attribute x1, but value v5. So I would do it here. And again, you know, everything above it is minus, everything below it is plus, right? So I predict a plus when condition is true, and I predict a minus when condition is false, right? So what's the point? The point is that I can take, uh, this is just in two dimensions, right? Kind of quite complex decision boundary, and I can describe it very nicely with a decision tree. And another thing that you can see is that I could keep running this decision tree all the way until every data point would be it in its own square. So it means I can chop this space as finely as I like. I, I wouldn't need to stop here, right? When I come here, I wouldn't need to stop. I could chop again and chop again and keep doing that until I get tired, right? So I can severely overfit the data. So it will be important to know when to stop training, right? Here, I have no noise, but imagine I would have a minus here. Then I'll try to split this here and here and here to capture that minus, right? It's a good question. When do you stop, right? But what I wanted to illustrate is how these trees are getting built. And we will talk about how do you build a tree using this kind of top-down approach, right? So the, the point is, how do I construct the tree, right? Given a data set D, how do I construct it? And essentially, the way we think of this is that we say, okay, I have a node. Um, and I need to come up with a split condition. I need to come up with a variable and a value on which I will test, right? So I need to, and, and as I come up with this, then the data set that comes on the top gets split to the left and to the right, right? If I drop 100 examples from the top, some of them satisfy the condition and go to the left, and some of them don't satisfy the condition and go to the right, right? So this 100 example, 100 data point data set got now split into two data sets, 10 on the left and 90 on the right, okay? And then, right, now this means I have a new node here. And then again, um, I have one of the two options. I can either decide to keep splitting or I decide to create a prediction node, okay? And then similarly on this side, I get to decide whether to keep splitting and I have to come up with a split condition, meaning attribute comma value, or I create, a, I create a prediction node, right? And if I would decide to keep splitting, it means I have to come up with some value and some um, attribute, uh, right, dimension where I wanna split, and I would um, uh, keep, uh, keep doing this, right? And as I would keep doing that, my data set would get again split, right? These 90 data points that come in, they get, for example, here split half-half, because half of the data satisfies this condition and half doesn't, okay? And uh, so on and so forth, right? You, you get the idea, okay? So in some sense, I'm taking my training data set and I'm partitioning it and splitting it uh, uh, into smaller but more, more fi fine-grained subchunks, and I'm splitting it based on these conditions that I encounter on the way from the top to the tree down towards, uh, towards the leaves, okay? Great, and so on and so forth. That's the idea. So this is how we are going to construct the tree, is to, to make a decision whether to split a node or not. And if we decide to split, then the question is what variable, what attribute, and what value. And if we decide not to split, then we have to be able to construct a prediction node, right? So basically the question is whenever we come up with a, to a given node, let's say a, a, a node G in this case, we need to decide, do we continue building the tree? And the answer, if the answer is yes, then we have to decide which variable, which attribute, and which value do we want to split on? And if the answer is not, then we have to make a prediction. We have to create a predictor node, uh, a hexagonal node in my pictures, right? Those are the two fundamental um, steps. So here is the pseudocode about how to build the tree, right? Basically what I'm given in is a node, um, in the tree and uh, some data that comes to that node. And then I have to decide whether, um, I, given this data that comes into the node, I decide what is the best split. This split will, will partition the data to the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Then for the left-hand side, I check, should I stop? And if I decide to stop, 
Then I say, okay, on the left hand side, create a predictor node. If, if you don't create a predictor node, I say build a subtree on the left child with the left data set. And then I do the same thing on the right. If I have stopping criteria on the right, then you know, um, uh, n right child is a predictor node. Otherwise, uh, n's right hand child takes the data set and builds the subtree, right? So essentially calls this function recursively and this way our tree will get created, right? So I have the uh, build subtree, find best split, stopping criteria, and, um, um, uh, and then build the prediction node. Those are the three functions I have to specify. So what I will do next is tell you how to do these three functions. How would you, how would you implement them and how would you do them? How do you find the split? How do you decide to stop? And how do you build a prediction node? How do you split? That's the first question, right? Um, there are several different criteria. If you are doing regression, you can use this notion of purity. Where the idea is that you have the, you have a data set, a set of the data points coming into the node, and given the condition on the node, this data gets split to the left and to the right, right? To the left goes the data that satisfies the condition, and to the right goes the data points that don't satisfy the condition. Then what you can, what you can do is, you can do the following, is basically say, I want to find a split that will maximize um, what is called purity. Right, so you are, you are doing the following. You are saying, I will find the, the x, the attribute and the value such that the variance of the stuff going inside into the node, and now that I have split it, the, um, is the variance on the left and variance to the right multiplied by the number of data to the left and to the right. I want this difference to be as big as possible, right? So, uh, right, the idea is this is the variance of the data coming in. And this is the variance of the data coming out. And if this difference is big, it means that I have a big variance and small variance, which means I decreased the variance, which means uh, I have increased the purity of my data. When I say variance, I really mean variance in the output labels, right? So I'm saying um, what's the variance in the, in the y of the data coming in, and after the split, what's the variance in y uh, on the left plus the variance of the y on the right, okay? So I would want to now search over attributes and split values such that I maximize uh, this, uh, this difference, okay? This is called purity. Um, this is used for regression. What if I have classification? In classification, I would use the notion of information gain. So let me explain what information gain is. Uh, it will came, take me a couple of slides. But this will essentially allow me to say what is the best split I can choose if I consider to split the data at that given node, right? So information gain measures how much, um, um, how much a given attribute x tell me, tells me about the class y, right? And the more x reveals about y, the better split it is. That's the idea, okay? So the way we'll formalize this, we'll say information gain of y given x uh, the way you can think of this is in terms of a kind of Shannon entropy and coding and, and transmitting information over a channel, where the idea is I need to transmit information about y over a binary link. Um, and the question is how many bits on the average would it save us if we, both ends of the line would know value of x, right? So the, the bigger the information gain, the more x tells you about the y. Okay, so let me now try to build up how do you compute information gain. So the first thing you need to define is the notion of entropy. And the way you think of entropy, it's the smallest possible number of bits um, on, on, on average per symbol needed to transmit a stream of symbols across a channel, right? And these symbols, uh, this stream of symbols is drawn from the distribution of x, right? So we would say entropy of x is simply a sum over the domain of x P, uh, P of x times log P of x, okay? And uh, intuitively, the idea is if I have high entropy, then, then, um, then uh, distribution of x is uniform. It's, it's in some sense uh, boring, 
right? The histogram basically would be flat. And if I have low entropy, then um, uh, X is from a varied distribution with a lot of peaks, peaks and valleys. And the histogram of this distribution will have narrow, narrow uh, peaks, right? So if you say, what is high entropy? High entropy is this kind of uniform noise. Low entropy is when kind of the data is concentrated in a small part, right? So this is about the entropy of a single uh, random variable. Now, the second thing is, now I want to go and, and start talking about information gain. So suppose I want to predict Y given that I have X, right? Imagine X is the college major and Y is, uh, y is whether somebody likes a given movie or not, right? So then I could say the following. For example, I can say, what's the, what's the probability that people like this movie? And I would say, okay, out of these uh, uh, eight cases, four said yes, so it's 0.5. You know, what's the probability that um, somebody um, graduates in math and doesn't like this movie? It's 0.25 because out of all the, out of all the rows here that, that match this, there is um, uh, two rows that should, uh, that should match this, right? And then I can also now compute the, the entropy. So for example, I could say, what is entropy of y? And simply I say, aha, y has two values, yes and no. So it takes yes half of the time, says, takes no half of the time. So here is, you know, minus one half, log base two, one half. This is for yeses and this is for nos. So the entropy of this would be one, right? And then if I say, what's the entropy of x? x now here takes, uh, uh, three different values, and again, I could compute for each one of them the probability and compute the entropy, okay? Now that I have the entropy, I need to uh, just kind of entropy of X. I want to define what is called specific conditional entropy. And this is simply entropy of a given variable kind of um, limited to the cases in which X takes value of V. So this is the entropy uh, of y among only those records for which x has value v, okay? So, you know, I could say, what's the entropy of y given that x equals math? So I would simply only look records where x equals math, and then I say, you know, what's the entropy of y here? I have um, uh, two yeses and two nos, so based on this formula I showed you before, the entropy equals one. Right? While here, for example, for history, history is uh, here and here. Um, so in, for these two cases, I always get a value of no. So the entropy is, is uh, very low. It's actually zero. Okay? So that's how I compute specific conditional entropy. I just limit the records based on the condition after the bar. Okay? So that's, the, that's now specific conditional entropy. Now I need to define what is called a conditional entropy. And conditional entropy is the average of specific conditional entropies over the, the domain of X, right? So the idea is if you choose a, re a, a record at random that will, um, that will be the conditional entropy of Y, conditioned that the rows value that you selected has a value X, right? So this is the expected number of bits Y to transmit in, if both sides know the value of the attribute X. So how you compute it is here. You essentially say, I will sum up over the domain of X. Here is the probability that X takes this, that value times the specific conditional entropy of Y given X, okay? Just a simple, we already know how to compute this, this guy. Now all we are doing is we, we try every possible X, say what fraction of time does X take that value, and then compute the entropy of Y given that value of X, okay? That's the, that's the idea. And this is called now conditional entropy. Um, I, the way you can, um, you can think of conditional entropy, conditional entropy in some sense is weighted average of specific conditional entropies where weights come with, uh, based on the probability that X takes that value uh, V. That's the idea, right? So um, to give you an example, given my, my data set, um, oops, right? Um, here is the value uh, V um, uh, for X, math history CS. This is the prior probability of X, right? Half of the time people major in math, quarter in history and quarter in CS. 
And then these are the uh, specific conditional entropies of y given that x takes that value, right? We already computed it for math. I computed it for history. And then for CS, I only look at the records for CS. As we all know, CS are very romantic people, so they know uh, they like this movie uh, with, uh, with uh, entropy zero, okay? So now if I multiply these things together in this weighted average, I get the, uh, the conditional entropy of y given x to be 0.5, okay? So now I think I've done all the work that I can tell you now what is the information gain. Okay, so the information gain is simply, the way you think of it is the difference between entropy of y minus the entropy of y given that you know x, right? So the way to, to interpret this is to say, I need to tell you why, how many bits do I save if both of us know x, right? If I tell you that, that, that you know, imagine I, I, I wanna tell you how old someone was. Um, and, and maybe, you know, before I give you anything, any other information, we both say, oh, they can be any random person on the planet. So here is our belief, how old somebody is. But you know, maybe I go and I, I tell you um, uh, the, uh, the, the first name of that person. And if I tell you the first name of that person, that actually tells you something about how old they are, because you know, in different, different times, different names are popular, right? So that's essentially the idea. Right? So now you could say, what's the information, right? Here is the entropy of x, of y. Here is the entropy of y given x. So, you know, what is the information gain of y given x? It's one minus one half, so it would be one half, right? So this means that x tells you about um, y, it gives us about half a bit of information, okay? So that's essentially the idea. And to give you an example how this would look like, right? Imagine uh, you want to predict whether somebody is going to live past 80 years, right? And you have various features of, in your database about these people. Then if you would do the information gain measurements, then you know information gain of long life given hair color, it's essentially zero. Hair, hair color doesn't tell you how long somebody is going to live, right? But for example, knowing whether they are a smoker or not, that will have very high information gain because smokers tend to die younger. Right? Or gender also gives you high information gain because women tend to live longer, right? I think about five to 10 years, right? So if I know somebody's a woman, my, I know something that tells me something about whether they are going to live longer. And if I know last four digits of your social security number, that should essentially tell me zero because those are random, right? So what information gain tells us, it tells us how much information about, about y is contained in x, right? So in some sense, I ask what feature is the most informative to tell me about the outcome y, right? So attribute that has higher information gain is a good split. That's a long story short, okay? So now we know how to split, right? So I just told you how to do this find best split. You, you can evaluate information gain uh, for classification or you evaluate purity and you try out several different splits and return the one that has high information gain or high purity, okay? Um, now the next thing is stopping criteria. That's the second thing we are doing. Yes? Uh, so what we were talking about how to evaluate a particular criterion, um, but it doesn't tell you how to search the space of possible criteria. Uh, awesome question. Uh, what great, great observation. So what we just did is if somebody tells me whether to split on this attribute, this is how much information gain I will get, right? Because this tells me if I, if I split on smoker, yes, no, here's the information gain. Of course, I didn't, now the question is how do you find, like, uh, how do you find the best split? The way you would find the best split is that you in some sense consider a, a set of all possible splits or some kind of uh, uh, heuristic way evaluate a subset of possible splits. So there is no elegant way to optimize over the splits. I only told you if you have a split candidate, how to evaluate it. But there is no elegant way to search over split candidates. So in the case of like a continuous variable, would you like manually choose a variable and then a threshold? Great, great question. So what do you do with continuous variable? Um, give me 10 minutes. I'll explain. Okay? No, really, I will. 
I, I, so it's cool ways, but if I explain now, then I won't be able to explain it later. All right, good question. Thank you. Uh, good, okay, I like the questions, so, so ask them. Okay, great. We talked about find best split, if you know what split candidate is. Now we wanna find the, decide whether we wanna keep building or we stop. Um, and then, you know, we will need to figure out what the predictor node is, All right? So the question is when to stop. And there are two strategies when to stop. One way to stop is when the leaf is pure. Right, if you go back to my example, when that area was full of blue pluses or full of red minuses, it was homogeneous, it was pure, so I am done. If I'm doing regression, I say when the variance in value y is smaller than some epsilon, I, I got this pure leaf, I will stop, okay? That's one way, and another way is very different. You would say I will stop training, um, uh, splitting the node uh, when the amount of data in the leaf is too small. Right, so you would say, if I get less than 100 training instances in a given node, I, I don't feel comfortable further splitting the, the node because I don't have enough data and I worry that I will overfit. Right, so it just says, if I don't have enough data, I will stop and not overfit. This is this kind of thinking, and this thinking is, I found this pure node, this great prediction where everything has the same value right, the, vari the variance is less than some epsilon, I'm ready to stop. There's nothing more for me to do, right? And you can use both these criteria. You need to decide how much data you have and what do you feel comfortable with here. Um, and, and variance, um, you can do something similar, okay? So this is now whether you should stop. Now that if we decided to stop, now we need to create a predictor node, right? We have to predict, uh, create this, uh, uh, a hexagonal node in my notation, right? What do you do? You have a few, a few ideas. One is that just you look at the average y value of the data at that node, and that's your prediction. It sound, it, it, it's actually fine, right? Because if the data, so if you do this, then essentially what this means is that you take your, your high dimensional function and you are approximating it with a step function. And given that you can split your data as finely as you want, you can approximate the step function, like this continuous function with a very fine grained step, fun step function. So this is what this would be. Now, another option is to basically build a simple linear regression model out of the examples in the leaf. That's another option. So this would mean that then you're approximating your high dimensional function with a kind of a set of piecewise linear functions, right? Either piecewise, constant functions or piecewise linear functions. What do people do for classification? The idea is you, your output, your prediction is the most common y of the examples in the leaf, right? So if, if this would be, for example, um, uh, in up there 0.42, it could be that if I'm doing binary classification, 42% of the data uh, that comes into, into that leaf node would be uh, would be of, of, the, of that uh, label that I would predict, okay? That's essentially the idea. So not too much complexity here because the idea is that as you are splitting, you so finely chop the, chop the space that you don't have to be too smart uh, about what do you put in the leaf node, okay? So um, this is what I wanted to say about uh, this. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, linear regression of if you know, to yeah. that on all the features of the features basically. Ah, when you build, so the question was when you build the linear regression in the leaf node, what features do you use? You use all the features, but you only build it on the data that comes into the leaf, right? That's all you, that's all you care about, right? Only the data comes to the leaf, and then this, this uh, linear regression will only be evaluated on the subset of, of data that comes into the lift. So it will be evaluated only on a sub range of your data space, if you think of it that way. Okay, good question. Yes, anything else? Yes, great. In most supervised learning algorithms, we see one example at a time and are updating some sort of objective. So just to uh, clarify here, we're looking at the entire data set at the same time. Correct, so what you say in, in uh, when you are doing stochastic gradient updates, 
which is you know what we did in what we did in um, our uh, SVD latent factors model. What you do when you train neural networks? Those are streaming algorithms, right? You say I get a small batch of data and I update my model. These are not streaming algorithms. These are algorithms that say I have my entire data set ready for me to consume, and I consume the training data set to build the model. Okay, so they are not online. They are not streaming. All right. Good. So now what I want to talk is actually how would you do this on super large scale? How would you do this on, uh, on MapReduce? And uh, this is actually a paper that was published uh, by Google people a few years ago. And as far as I know, this is still state of the art in terms of building massive scalable parallel decision trees. That's the, that's the idea. Right? Um, so the idea is given a data set of hundreds of attributes, we want to build a decision tree. Um, and here is how this will look like. Right? This tree will be relatively small, 10 levels. Um, the data set is too large to keep in memory. The, say, the data set is too big to scan over it on a single machine. So we will use MapReduce. Um, what this was loose, used at Google, maybe I have example later, but essentially this was used to to, 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 to make the most valuable prediction of them all. And this is predicting whether a user clicks on an ad or not. And you would be amazed how much human resources, um, brain power goes into this problem of predicting with what probability is a given user going to click on a given ad. Uh, that's probably the most valuable prediction engine. Um, you know, Facebook cares, Google cares, Amazon cares, uh, Instagram cares, Pinterest cares, LinkedIn cares, um, everyone cares. Okay, so um, this is where this was used. So the the algorithm is called Planet, and it's uh, the, the, the it stands for par parallel learner for assembling numerous ensemble trees, right? And it's a sequence of MapReduce jobs that builds a decision tree, um, and it's implemented. Um, both on Hadoop in MapReduce, but also on Spark in the MLlib, if you would like to use it. Um, it can handle hundreds of numerical, meaning discrete and continuous, uh, but not categorical attributes. Uh, the target variable is uh, numerical, it's a regression. So it was used to predict the probability of a click, right? Um, and the splits are binary because uh, our um, um, we are assuming variables are numerical, so then we, all we need to figure out is what value to split a given attribute on. The assumption is the decision tree is small enough that, uh, that it can fit in memory of a single mapper, but the data is too large to be kept in memory. Those are the assumptions. Now, here is the, 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 um, the diagram of the, entire, uh, of the entire architecture. So this will be a sequence of MapReduce jobs. So it will be kind of a bit complex. But the idea is, that I will have this master. This master keeps track uh, of everything and decides how to grow the tree, right? We will have some tree that we want to keep growing. We will grow it level by level. So one growing it for one level, what I show in red up there, that is one, one uh, map reduced job. So if I want to grow it for three levels, I will have to go kind of through three map reduced jobs, okay? And then the master uh, has the following things. It knows what the model is. It has some attribute metadata. And then the master goes and creates this MapReduce jobs that take the input data, the current model, and the attribute metadata, and go and build one level of the tree. And what these MapReduce jobs will be used for goes back to your question. They will, they will basically be given a set of split candidates, and they, and they will evaluate their quality. Right, so the idea is master will say, here is a set of split candidates. The each reducer will say, here is the current model plus the set of split candidates. Let me go over the data, evaluate those splits, return them to the master, and then master decides how to grow the tree for one more level. Again, generates a new set of split candidates. I will explain what that is, and this keeps going, okay? So the map reduce job is essentially evaluating how good of a split, the, uh, how good of a split uh, do we get, okay? So um, as I said, tree is built in levels. And uh, here is how building one level of the tree looks. First, master decides on candidate splits. Candidate split is a triple of node, 
uh, attribute value, right? Now this, for example, f attribute is, you know, what feature are we going to split on with what value? This is called a candidate split. So master will somehow decide and create a universe of candidate splits. Map reduce jobs then take this candidate splits, take the current model, evaluate it on the entire data set, and return the, the, the quality score for every of the candidate splits. The master aggregates the candidate split uh, scores, decides where to grow the tree and where not to grow the tree, and then continue. Okay, so three steps, candidate splits, quality of candidate splits, master decides what to do. Okay, and here is where the MapReduce job happens. Um, here is uh, how to, how to uh, uh, think of this, is, um, right, master will tell the mappers which candidate splits to consider. As I said, candidate split is a triple of node in the tree, variable on which we are going to split, and the value on which we are splitting. And then each mapper gets a subset of data um, plus the split candidates, plus the current model, and computes partial statistics for a given split candidate. And then the reducer will collect partial statistics for the split candidates, uh, aggregate them, and compute the final statistic for every split candidate. And now, for every split candidate, now the master wakes up again, takes all the, the, the scores of all the split candidates, and decides whether to keep growing the tree or to stop, right? That's essentially the idea, right? Where input is the data sets, master sends into the mappers the tree and the candidate splits, um, and then the output here will be candidate split and some partial statistic so that the reducer can collect it, and out we get the final statistic for every candidate split, so that in fourth point, the master can, um, can aggregate it uh, and make a decision, okay? So let me give you uh, now the overview and then we'll go step by step. So this is, we built three level by level. Man, one map reduce job builds one level of the tree. The mapper, right, considers a number of candidate splits. Candidate split is a triple node in the tree, attribute and value. Um, and each, each um, uh, mapper gets, a to, gets to see the subset of the data. So it evaluates the quality of that split on that subset of the data. Um, for each split, it stores these partial statistics for the subsets of data that a given mapper gets. And these partial split statistics are sent to the reducer who aggregates, collects these partial statistics and determines the, the final um, score of a given candidate split. And then, you know, the master collects all this and makes, the, and makes a decision how to grow the tree. Okay, that's the idea. Now, as I said, what does Mapper do? Mapper loads the current decision tree model, like as, as you would have it up there, right? Imagine Mapper loads this model, and Mapper knows that now the trees, the, that F, G, H, and I needs to be grown, right? So the, the master will generate these candidate splits, these triples, for each mapper to consider. Um, and each mapper, because the data is partitioned, sees a subset of the data and evaluates the quality or the score of each of the split on its own subset of data. The way it does this is that it takes a data point, right, um, and drops it into this partially labeled tree and then sees where the data, data point lands and if it lands in F, then this can be used for all the splits that, that consider node F, right, um, and so on, right? And um, for each leaf node, right, the mapper will now keep the statistics. What is the data that reaching that leaf node? And then how the data gets split to the left and to the right under this candidate split S, okay? And uh, the reducer will then aggregate the statistics about reaching the data left and right, data that goes left and right of the, of the, of the split, um, and aggregate it across all the subsets of data over all the mappers to then determine what is the final score for a given split. Okay, that's the idea. Um, now, what does the master do? The master 
con controls kind of everything, monitors everything, and it ru runs multiple MapReduce jobs. And there are three types of MapReduce jobs. First is MapReduce initialization, and this is run only once. And basically for each uh, attribute, it identifies the values that should be considered for a split. I will explain how to do this, because this was the question before. Then the MapReduce job of find best split is run multiple times, once per level. And this finds the best split from the set of split candidates that we uh, uh, generated in the initialization. And we do this when there is too much data to fit in memory. And then there is a small optimization where there is another job that's called in-memory build. And the idea is that this is only run once. And the idea is if, if the amount of data is small enough that it fits into the memory of the single mapper, then just mapper loads all the data and builds the entire subtree from there on, right? So this is just an optimi optimization that says if you build your tree up here and after you are somewhere very deep, I don't know, down here, and the amount of data gets so small that you can just load it into the mapper, then just load the data and build the rest of the tree in memory rather than running these MapReduce jobs because they are slow. So you only want to run MapReduce when the data is big. When the data is small, just build the tree in memory the, using the pseudocode I showed you, okay? And then, right, what's the output? The output is the model file. A file describes, uh, that describes kind of the state of the model, meaning the structure of the tree and the, um, and the, uh, the split values and split attributes as we move down. Good. So let me now go through uh, all these four steps, right? Master node, initialization, find best split, and then this, op this kind of optimization that is called in-memory build. So master controls the entire process and determines the state of the tree as it grows it, right? It decides if the node should be split. Um, and if there is little data entering a given node, then the master runs in memory build map reduce job to grow an entire subtree from that node onward, right? If there is a small amount of data I know reaching my node F, then I will just run the in memory build and build the entire subtree from F downward, okay? And, uh, and then if the amount of data entering a given leaf node is large, then the master will la launch this map reduce job called find best split to evaluate the candidates for best split. Um, master will then collect the data from this best split and then decide wh wh what split to, to execute at a given node. That's essentially the idea. And then of course, the master would update the model and again decide whether to run in memory build or another find best split. That's the master. Now we need to talk about uh, uh, initialization. We need to decide what candidate splits to even consider. So here is the idea. The idea is I want to figure out all, attribute val all attributes and all attribute values for which should be considered for a split, right? And this initialization process will generate what we called before attribute metadata, and this will be then loaded in memory by other tasks. Essentially for a given, uh, for a given node, we need to figure out what variable and what value to split on. Those are, those are, the, those are the things. So now the question is, which splits should we even consider? Which X and X, J and V should we even consider? Okay? And the idea is that uh, a split will be defined by a triple, node, attribute, and value, right? And what the, the, what the, um, the, the initial MapReduce job will generate, will generate a set of pairs, attribute, value, and then the master will append the node ID when it needs to, to do. But uh, initialization only generates variable comma value. That's the idea. So the question is, which split should we even consider, right? For small data, you could just sort your, um, by accord, your data according to your attribute value, and you could consider splitting at every possible position, right? You could consider at every possible position a split if you have little data. But uh, if data um, are not uniformly populated, many splits may not really make any difference, right? In a sense that if you have lots of data very concentrated, then you don't necessarily need to, to, to split that super finely, right? So imagine I have a, a particular attribute J that has the following values. 
right? You see how it's kind of super concentrated here around 10 and then, you know, something around a bit 11 and here, so it's kind of highly non-uniform. While here I, s I have a big gap, right, between 2 and a 7, so this would be a good split. While here maybe I don't care splitting at 1.2 or I split at 1.3, right? So there are different choices I may wanna, I may, I may wanna make. How do you even consider candidates for splits? So the idea how to solve this is to consider a limited number of splits such that each split moves about the same amount of data, right? And I will make precise what do I mean by move the same amount of data, okay? So the idea is that I would like to take attri uh, attribute feature xj and I would like to consider um, where to split it. And the way I could do this is the following. I could create this type of histogram where, where essentially I would uh, count how often do I see a given value, right? So the idea is how often does my attribute xj take a given value? And then the idea is that I want to use this boundary points as the, as the points at which I want to have uh, my histogram to be split, right? And how would I now create this histog this boundary points where basically the same amount of data is in each of these regions, right? If you, if I would sum up these heights of these bars in every of these uh, regions, the sum of the bars is about equal, right? So this means I would consider a split here, another one here, another one here, right? So this means that the attri attribute, the, the, this given feature takes value 10 very commonly. So I would consider a split before 10 and I would consider a split after 10, okay? So now the question is, how would I compute? How would I do this to get this kind of what is called a equidepth histogram, right? And here is, here is the idea. I will use hashing, right? The idea is that I want to have an equal number of elements per bucket. So the way I could do this is that I could const, con, con, uh, create this by sorting the, the, um, the, um, the equally spaced splits, right? I would simply take the, all the values of the attribute, sort them, and then I would consider, I don't know, splitting at every fifth value, right? And this, would, this means that in every split about the same amount of data would be captured. And you can now notice that this would mean I split between 3 and 4, I split between 9 and 10, 10 and 11, 14 and uh, 12 and 14, and 18 and 19, right? So this splitting is highly non-uniform in the values, but it's uniform in the amount of data that, that, that is between the split values, right? So that's the idea, that an equal amount of um, data gets split at every time. So this would be now candidates for my, for my splits for an attribute that takes these types of values. How would I make this go faster? Basically, the way I'd go faster is that rather than taking all the data and all the, all the values of the attribute, I could create a sample and then sort and take equally spaced splits um, in, in, in that sample. Um, and, and this will work really well in practice because it's kind of a simple, um, simple type of operation. So this allows us to decide where to split. Is on, and the idea is to use this um, equidepth histogram as it is called. Essentially, we want to split such that every split captures about the same amount of data. Okay? Um, great. Now, number three, which is find best split. And this is the procedure we'll run multiple times to generate one level of the tree, right? And uh, here is the idea. The idea is that we are given a, a particular split candidate for a, for a given node, and we want to find, um, find out what is the split candidate that maximizes purity. And we defined this purity before, right? We said this is the variance in y uh, of the data coming into the, into the node, like I have pictured here. And then after we apply this particular candidate split, some data goes to the left, some data goes to the right. Uh, there is the, the amount of variance on the left, amount of variance on the right, and I want the difference between the two to be as high as possible. One, one thing that we will exploit is if you ask, how do I compute variance? The way you compute the variance is that this is essentially, um, uh, 1 over n sum of the, of the squares of the values minus 
1 over n sum of the values squared. OK? And uh, this is the same kind of sufficient statistic trick I think we used in the BFR clustering, if I remember. And here you can use the same, the same trick. And the reason why is this so useful is because these statistics are nicely aggregatable, right? I can aggregate them over a subset of data and then add them up. And some of the squares will still go, and some will still go. I will just have to square it at the end, right? So what is nice about variance is that I can compute it on subsets of data and then keep these statistics, add them together, and I have the variance on the entire data set, okay? So to compute purity of a, of a given uh, uh, subset of data D, we need, to, we need to compute the following equation, right? And the, ob the observation is that variance can be computed from this sufficient statistic, which is n number of data points, sum of the y's, and uh, sum of the square values of y, right? So each mapper will process the subset of the training data uh, D sub m that is assigned to it, and it will compute number of data points in m, some of the squares, some of the y values in m, and some of the squares of the values in m, right? And this is the data that comes into that, into that leaf. Um, and then the reducer will now combine the statistics to compute the global variance and purity, right? So the way now the, the reducer computes the, vari the variance is to say, let me go over all the mappers, and every mapper gives me QM. I sum up QMs, I sum up the, the N, the number of data points here uh, to compute the left-hand side of the variance formula. And then here is the, the sum of Ys. Again, I sum them up over all the mappers, um, uh, uh, divide this by one over the total number of data points and square that, and this is now my variance formula, right? So the point is that every mapper can compute this sufficient statistic. The reducer just adds them together and we have the global purity formula here for us to use. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the elegant part, right? So here is what the mapper will do. Mapper loads the results from the initialization task, loads the candidate splits, loads the current model, um, and then um, it loads the set of candidate splits. Node, uh, attribute value, um, and the value on which we want to split. And then for each data record, the map, the, the, the map function does the following. For each, for each node, in the tree, it stores the statistics about what's the, what's the data that reaches that node, right? So it, reaches, it says um, this node ID in the tree, this is the data that reaches it. Some of the Y values, some of the squares of Y values, and the number of data points that reaches that node. This is coming from the top. And then for each split, it keeps the following data, right? It says split is node ID, attribute, and split value. And for each split, it says, what is the data that goes to the left, and what is the data that goes to the right, right? So this is some of the some of the some of the y values, some of the squares of the y values, and number of data points that go to the left. Now, what goes to the right um, is um, what goes to the right is uh, this minus that, right? Whatever doesn't go to the left, um, you just subtract it from the overall that goes to the right. So all you need to do is keep track of the left side and you can compute what is on the right side, okay? From basically taking the differences, right? Because you know what goes into the, into the node, whatever goes to the left, what didn't go to the left must, has go, must, must have gone to the right hand, right hand branch of the tree, okay? And this is, this is now uh, uh, for every node and for every split um, at that uh, given node, okay? And uh, the, the mapper will compute these statistics and then push them out to the reducer. So what the reducer will do, it will load all the node ID and then the list of um, some of the, of the Y values, some of the squares of the Y values and the number of uh, nodes, uh, number of data points that that mapper saw. And then it will also, um, and it will aggregate these statistics uh, per, every, per every node. And then it will do the same for every, for every split. It will aggregate the statistics S, Q, and M, uh, and N over all the, all the mappers that have run. And now this means that for every 
for every split, we'll be able to compute the, the purity, right? For, uh, we will compute the purity according to the formula I gave you, where the formula uh, com includes the computing the variance of the data coming into the node, variance that goes of the data goes to the left, and variance of the data that goes to the right. And given this partial statistics, here is how to compute the variance, right? So at the end, what the reducer can do is, for every node ID, it can, com it can output the best split it found by essentially aggregating data coming from all the mappers and then computing purity using the variance formula given here. And that should be, um, that should be it, right? To give you um, a quick uh, overall idea, right? The idea is that as the, map, as the master decides it wants to keep growing the tree here, then uh, it will say, I wanna, it will send to the, to the map reduce job the, the node IDs where it wants to grow, the, the split candidates, and then the mappers are going to, to say what is the data coming into every of these nodes, and uh, according to each of these split candidates, what are these partial statistics? And these mappers will output the data to the reducer, who will, comp who, who will now aggregate these partial statistics to, to be able to compute the variance of the data coming into the node, and then for every split, the data that goes left and right, so it can compute the, the purity, and then uh, the, the reducer will output for every node the split that gives us the best purity. Um, and then the master will decide what to do next. Um, so this is uh, what, how the overall architecture um, for this thing, um, for the planet algorithm uh, looks like. Let me see if I wanna show this one. Maybe I can, uh, I can uh, take a question and then I'm happy to, to give you more of an example. Yes? If you don't assume that your uh, covariates are independent from each other, wouldn't you technically want to rerun this initialization at each node since it's receiving a, a subset of the data? Great question. So the question is, why wouldn't you want to rerun the initialization for every node as you keep building the tree? Because the distribution of your variables or covariates has changed because you, you kind of selected a subset of data based on the conditions above the tree. So the, the answer I think is the following. If you would want to do this run multiple times, then you would have to add another round of MapReduce to compute these candidate splits. Um, and I think just for that, that in theory might be better. Um, in, in practice, this would create your, the runtime of your algorithm would increase for a factor of two, right? Because you'd have, you would double the number of MapReduce uh, iterations. And then another issue would be that then you'd have a lot and a lot of split candidates. So I think just like engineering wise, what the authors uh, decided to do is to pre-compute the split candidates ahead of time and then just keep working with them and make sure you have enough that even when you kind of subset the data, there is still good split candidates in there. So it's a good point, it's an excellent point you make that after you have subselected the data, those splits might not be, uh, might not move the same amount of data. That is correct. I think just for practical reasons, this is why they decided to do it this way. Good question, thank you. Anything here? Anyone here? First row is, oh great, yes, go ahead. Uh, since the splitting at a node is trying to sort of like separate the different labels better, uh -huh. why is the bucket independent and not the, the dimension of the tasks? So why is bucketing dependent? So bucketing is not, so the idea is you have these variables and each variable, each attribute can take lots of different values. Now, if, if the number of different values it takes is small, you could split at every possible value. But if, if your attribute takes seven million different values, then you cannot split at every little thing. So then, then you say, okay, I will split at a fixed number, I will only consider a fixed number of split points, maybe a thousand. And then you say, how would I choose thousand data points, a thousand split candidates? And, and the best, the thing that works best in practice is to take the, dis take, the, take, the, take the distribution and create this kind of equidepth histogram, right? Where you kind of slice it finely according to the distribution of the data. So where there is more data, you slice more finely. And when there is less data, you slice kind of 
with a bigger, bigger, um, in, uh, with longer interval. That's what this allows you to do. Good question. All right, anything else? Good, so um, let me um, uh, now give you uh, a bit of an example of how would, this, how would this work out if I really like write it down and say what happens when you wanna create some, when you wanna keep growing the tree at this level denoted in red, right? So then the way this would go is load the model, drop every example down, down the tree for a given mapper, um, right? If the tree hits a particular set of nodes, uh, keep the statistic what data came in, and then for the split, keep the statistic um, what, uh, again, what data goes to the left. Um, based on the difference between the what goes in and what goes to the left, you can compute the sufficient statistic what goes to the right. Um, and then after, after uh, the, the mapper is done, it outputs the key value pairs about these statistics, right? And then what does the reducer do? A reducer takes partial statistic for every node in the tree and sums up these partial statistics. Um, reducer also takes for every split candidate um, and the partial statistics for the split candidate, it sums up those partial statistics. And now using these partial statistics, the, 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 the reducer can, can evaluate purity uh, of each node of each candidate split using, the, using the, the, the data in T1 and using the data in T2. And, uh, and then it can return the best split. So the split with the smallest, uh, with the largest um, purity um, uh, to the master who can then decide what to do. And essentially this is one map reduced job to find best split for a given set of nodes with a, with a given predefined set of splits or split candidates, okay? Um, now, as I said, what would, the, what would the master do? Master would collect this data from reducers. So uh, the node ID at which we wanna split, what attribute feature we are splitting and what value and what is the purity value. And based on this, then the, then the, the master can decide what to do, right? If the data on the left and right is small enough, then the master can decide to run in memory build algorithm uh, and otherwise master would decide to run find best split algorithm, right? Um, and this way the tree, this decision tree would be run um, in, in levels uh, uh, and built um, and this can be done over huge amounts of data. Let me now quickly conclude about decision trees, right? So decision trees are this amazingly powerful technique and if you are participating in kind of a machine learning competition, then usually decision trees tend to win it. Um, any kind of Kaggle competitions where features are, uh, are clear, these, these are the methods to go, right? Um, they, they work really well for classification and regression and can work with many output classes. You can, they can do more than binary. You can classify into many different classes and it works really well. Um, it can work with real and real valued and categorical features um, and it can handle a few hundred, um, maybe thousands of features, but not millions of features, right? So decision trees don't work well with text or with long sparse vectors. So these features with, are generally dense so that every feature, every feature has a value. Um, and they, they allow us to create this kind of very complex uh, uh, feature um, decision boundaries it's important to have this early stopping when we stop when the amount of data in the node is not big enough to avoid overfitting. Um, there's a lot of applications like user profile and classification, landing page bounce prediction, you know, whether somebody clicks and leaves the page immediately and so on and so forth. Um, and this is one of kind of the mo single most popular data mining tool because it's easy to understand you can always look at the tree and say, does this make sense or not? You can kind of debug it by hand. It's easy to implement. It's amazingly easy to use. When the tree is built, it's easy to, to deploy it. Computationally, it's amazingly cheap. Um, and it's possible to mitigate overfitting um, either by early stopping or what I'll show you next. Um, and they do classification as well as regression well. And one thing people do with trees 
is that they don't learn one tree, but they learn a set of trees. And this is what is called an ensemble learning, where the idea is that you want to learn an ensemble of models, right? And this, in general, will give you better performance than if you have just one, one model. And how do you create multiple models? One way is to create, to use a technique that is called bagging. And the idea is that you want to learn multiple trees over independent samples of the same data set. So how do you create these data sets? The idea is for a given data set n on uh, d on n data points, you want to create another data set d prime that has the same number of data points which you sample from your data set d with replacement. And if you, de if you do the math, about 33% of the data points in d, in d prime will be duplicates and 66% will be unique, right? So essentially you take your data set d and now you create another data set d prime that you create by sampling with replacement for d, from d. And sometimes you will sample the same data point multiple times, but that is fine. And then the idea is that for each this type of d prime, you learn a separate decision tree. And when a new data point comes, you ask each of these decision trees, hey, what do you think? And then take their average prediction as your output, right? So here's the idea. When a data point comes in, each of these trees that you trained on different random versions of your training data set, you ask it to make a prediction. And then these trees do some kind of majority voting and you make a prediction. And this method is called bagged decision trees. And this is the way to go. People usually don't train just one tree. They would train multiple and, and then uh, take the majority voting or some kind of uh, consensus vote between all the trees. And that's your, that's your, that's your final prediction. Um, and uh, this works amazingly great. How do you create random samples of D? Hashing comes into, into, uh, into use where you can use a hash of the training record uh, and the tree ID to create a bucket and then uh, use the records that hash into a particular ra range of buckets or set of buckets to learn the tree. And this way the, sa the same sample is used uh, for uh, all the nodes uh, of the tree. And uh, uh, you know, this is how, how, how you can do these things and it will work uh, amazingly well, right? So now what's a further improvement over a bag decision trees is this method called random forests. Um, and uh, here the idea is that um, you, not, you not only train over the random subset of the data, you also learn on a random subset of the features. Um, and this would be called feature bagging, right? So, so you would be uh, bagging both the training data as well as the, as the features on which you learn. And again, um, this is the way to go, right? So create trees on subsets of data and subsets of features and then average their, their output. Um, and this is kind of what is the state of the art on many classification problems with dense features. Um, because these methods are amazingly robust, uh, amazingly scalable, um, and they allow us to break all kinds of symmetries in the data by using this kind of bagging and boosting techniques that uh, minimize the variance in the data. So um, with this, let me finish. Uh, on Thursday, we'll talk about neural networks and Michele is going to give the lecture. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>